So I've been playing Last Window, The Secret of Cape West, and Chase Cold Case Investigations, Distant Memories, Jesus Christ, these titles. Video games are all about the epic trilogies, as it's marketable, makes for nice collections and shit also satiates the lore childs. We got the all-time classics, the GOATS, like the Bouncer trilogy, with of course the first game, Cyber Org. A beat-em-up set in space. It's a bit stiff, as PS1 beat-em-ups go, mainly due to the camera, but a good first effort and a strong way to set up the universe nonetheless. Then we got the titular, the Bouncer! An absolute classic of game beloved by all. Fleshing out the characters and gameplay, fixing camera issues and introducing epic physics and motion blurs. It's great. Honestly, they could have ended the series then and there, but naturally we had to get a third one to round it all off. I.e. Uh, I'ma be real, they, they say that the third entry is often the weakest in a trilogy and man, does that ever ring true here. I think, as a reference to the first one, they made the protagonist silent, but there though, he never spoke and was only spoken to, but here, in the Boomer 3, he does speak, only you can't hear him. That's not how you do a silent protagonist, you stupid bitch game. Which is a clear fail for as far as I'm concerned. And of course, another epic saga is the Hotel Dust trilogy. One I've sadly only played and covered the first game from. It was a story starring Kyle Hyde, a former detective turned jobber man, jobbing his way to a hotel where a mystery related to his past happened. You had quirky characters, some wholesome vibes, epic betrayals and epic twists, stunning dames, and gameplay mostly consisting out of you walking in between dialogue triggers, and doing the odd item findy puzzly bits. It was good, it was great, and clearly deserving of a second game. Though, weirdly enough, much like the The Bouncer trilogy, it would not carry the same name. <laughs> Last Window, The Secret of Cape West once again stars Kyle Hyde. No longer a cop nor jobber man, but instead unemployed on his way home to his crummy, shitty apartment. When suddenly it is revealed that the whole complex is gonna get knocked down soon and that he needs to self-evict before the end of the month, with the landlady being quite mysterious about how or why, and that while despite being fired, an anonymous messenger is still trying to jobber him around regarding a thing called the Scarlet Star that's supposedly to do with the history of this very building as a hotel, but also Kyle himself. It retains a lot of the gameplay from the original, almost to a T, improving on some minor bits here and there, fleshing out the characters, fixing some of the camera issues, but abstaining from adding epic physics and motion blur. Or <laughs> at least not adding any more motion blur than what was already available. You can, however, still navigate these cute little 3D environments, enter examine mode when magnifying glass to probe shit proper, chat the folks and their 2D representations, and collect many a puzzle item, take tons of notes, and ask a plethora of questions, all the while the chillest possible tunes happily dump away in the background. God motherfucking day. Each conversation is based and structured as if it's its own little mystery or puzzle. The screen will darken, footsteps will sound, a door opens, quirky music rolls in as they be like, Oh hey Mr. Hyde, walk one, are you also worried about the thing? Prompting Hyde to prompt you the cool little cool prompt with the dingle jingle and to have you have him ask them what thing. The music changes to a more mysterious tone. Their expression shifts as they say, Ah, uh, well, this object, it's really important to me, I got it from person. And so you go out to find the thing and go to person, only to find out that it was actually stolen, as now the thief is nowhere to be found. Honesty, I made all of that up, but you best believe me, bitch, that each and every conversation is structured like that. Last window always keeps one engaged, interested, and feeling as if you're peeling away at some type of epic, mysterious plot, even though you are just chatting about someone's watch. Take the examinations, for example with the important objects always hiding around the tiniest of corners, oft requiring intense prodding on the touchscreen to learn shit, and having multiple facets like opening drawers and peering inside, checking signs closely and shaking shit about to see if it rumble. These are all minor things, sure, but they add up to the sense that you're actually sleuthing and detectiving. 
Not just looking at shit, but looking for shit. Even when you don't know what yet, you will always be probing. Which the DSS touchscreen is perfect for as well. As even something as minor and tiny as opening a door or a locker or drawer sees the camera slowly pulling in as the touch prompt appears as you carefully drag it open, insert or twist a key, or better yet, enter the code that you had scribbled down in your tangible last notebook. When then the music fades away, all to heighten the tension of you checking the mail. Sing has always had a knack for making mundanity interesting by truly highlighting how special the little things are. And Last Window exudes that idea out of every one of its interactive, pulsating, meaty blowholes. For another instance, for instance, everything tends to have some type of backstory assigned to it. Cal's briefcase used to be his father's, which he's owned for years. All of the objects in his rooms have quaint little memories attached to them, like the piggy bank being a gift from Mila of the first game. Not to mention how much shit everyone's rooms say about them in general, like how the bummy dude has tons of instruments and posters hinting at better times, or how the businessman has psychopath room. Last Window essentially can do something with the first game couldn't do because it was hotel and this game is apartment complex. Being big huge character based environmental storytelling. You learn a lot about the tenants, their hobbies, histories, secrets and just the simple fact that there's always more to them than first met the eye. The prodding basically doesn't only feel good through how it's structured mechanically, visually and orally, but also in how it's contextualized within its world, thus making the player give a shit. Be it something funny or heartwarming or just interesting, it, it'll make things memorable, which then in turn also makes the prodding that will no doubt follow from it feel more engaged and intuitive too. I mean, when the items in your inventory mean shit, and when you know why the characters say and do what they do, or that you at least want to know why they do these things, it becomes more much easier to figure out where the proverbial puzzle pieces are supposed to fit than it does in, say, survival horror games where you got wacky pendants up the ass with no clue what blowhole you're supposed to shove them into. Individually, these types of mows and bits are all good, but it is in the greater picture of the game where they become truly good. Thing is, is that Last Windings never lets up, whilst also remaining chill. It does this by constantly having things happen unexpectedly. Phones ring in, doors being opened, characters entering and leaving scenes, mysterious items being left in mysterious places. Every time I think about leaving or entering a room or talking to someone or casually examining an object, something wholly unexpected can happen right before I go to do it. And this shit kept me right on fucking toes and engaged to fuck. However, because most of these things will be very low-key, like the mysterious person entering your room just being your nice dopey friend Tony, or the creepy sudden phone call being Cal's mom, things tend to remain vibey. Although, either of them can still have some intriguing news to bring, but due to how the music is always in happy fun time leisure jazz mode, and the writing that I have yet to fully get into also being kinda long-winded yet equally meticulous and personality filled as the general gameplay is, shit never not ends up diminishing your chill. Last window contains the excitingest comfy, the hypest board, and by far and away the most urgent laziness that you will ever see. And it's generally really suitable for long-term entertainment as a result. Hours literally droop away as they do in game as well, all the while you soak in the cute mundanity that is Last Window. If there was ever a way that I could sum up this game, I'd say that it has a very grounded energy. I mean, look at this goddamn wake-up sequence. That is too fucking real. I love it and hate it. Same way when you browse Cull's kitchen, you spot him leaving random bottles of sauce in his pan cupboard, like, I don't know why I left this here, which, you know, probably everyone has at least one or two of those objects in house that you need to pick up and place elsewhere, but you simply can't be fucked to do so, and before you know it, it's been there for years, and now it just kind of belongs there. 
It's small touches like these that have you connect with the world in a big, big way, not to mention with Kyle. Like, the dude gives his thoughts on everything, so all of that shit I just went over regarding examining tells you a lot about him, too. He's a very dry, tired, no shits given type of guy who's secretly a bit insecure and caring deep down, but doesn't always want to show that. Oh, he won't even outright mention it, but anyone who knows this much about anything and anyone and also has so much to say about them surely gives a shit. He do be a very curious boy, after all, was a detective slash cop for a reason, and so as a frame to view this mundane as game and its detailed as world through, this grumpy, sardonic, yet involved log of a man is the most perfect one. Which then brings me to the rest of the cast. You got Tony, the prior mentioned bummy, scruffy, but sociable, sweet-talking musician who's the closest thing Kyle has to a homie. Marie, an easily emotional, often suspicious, on-edge lady who mainly keeps to herself. Dylan, a curious dude who does maintenance work within the complex and is essentially the untrustworthy rumor mill, all up in people's shit. Frank, the ex-cop, miserable curmudgeon who wants dick shit to do with said shit. And many, many more, all equally as complex and layered as the history of the building and the character's arc within which it contains. You see, all of them are essentially opposites of one another, with Kyle being the sole equalizer in their midst, resulting in some rather spicy banter, easily going from 0 to 100 on the argumentative and mystery and the wholesomeness and comedy skills as each of their effortlessly contextualized arcs violently clash and cohese against each other. Because, I mean, why is Marie so easily suspicious? Who hurt her and what she trying to hide? How does it tie into Tony? And why does Frank hate everybody, but specifically Tony, even though he's easily the nicest guy? Again, it's that whole idea of making the most interesting shits out of super normal and mundane stuff. The, the, b b because boy golly Jesus, these petty squabbles and mailbox openings fucking go places, trust me. This is Sing's last proper game, after all, and so it also feels like the most of them, for sure. Honed perfected, smoothed out and kinkless, yet absolutely unrelenting in its itselfness. But uh, yeah, th this is where the studio behind the game ended. They filed for bankruptcy on March of 2010. It was only a small studio with less than 30 people on staff, almost all of them hailing from River Hill and Human, thus being deeply rooted in the Japanese adventure visual novel mystery genre, perfecting, in my opinion, exactly that at Sing. The brunt of these 30 folks found refuge over at Arxis, where luckily they were still able to finish the Hotel Dusk Trilogy! You know, they say that the third entry is often considered the weakest in a trilogy and... <laughs> <laughs> man, does that ever ring true here? Oh, luckily not by much. Like The Quiet Man, Chase Cold Case is more of a spiritual threequel than anything else. It retains a general vibe, sound, art style, and even gameplay, kinda, but it tells a rather different type of story, nor does it star Cal Hyde, as Nintendo held their fucking property hostage, so Koto and Anase it is. AKA and or IE, the rookie detective eager to do shit, and the grumpy veteran detective sick of said shit. One day, they get a phone call saying that a cold case regarding a big gas explosion accident wasn't an accident, but instead a murder. And so, the whole game revolves around them bringing in those involved years after the fact to get them to say their say. You do this by forwarding text, clicking option, and... Uh, well, uh, that's it, really. You don't get to examine some photos, but it's all very linear and uninteractive, as it's a visual novel, actually. I see people throw that term at Hotel Dusk and Last Window as well, and why they aren't never not that, they're defo more so adventure games, and this is not that. The only, like, mechanic it has is this bar here, which represents the amount of times you can ask the wrong questions, but A, that generally ain't too hard to do, when B, getting a game over means starting back more or less exactly where you were anyway. CCC is very detached from itself. You don't go sleuthing, you aren't really sold on the characters and their depth over long periods of time. You're instead just kinda chucked into a mystery with tons of people you don't know and places you can't visit or often even see cause you're always in their office. 
It's certainly quite different from Kaz's hands-on adventures, to say the very fucking least. And that, in and of itself, can be a vibe. Police, desk work, and interrogation do seem like pretty lonely, detached jobs where you only see people as suspects and victims as case files rather than persons. The colder, yet smoother, tenser OST and the blue-hued-up visuals, as well as the Nase himself, appear to embody that idea. He's not curiously passionate, he's just on the job and quite mean to Koto, constantly berating her for her getting shit wrong. And of course, because you're a fucking cop, the relationship with those you talk to is far less friendly. People is pissed off, on edge, sad or scared. The, the general things you too might feel when getting dragged away from your free time into a fucking interrogation booth with some assholes who thinks you're full of shit regardless of what you're saying. It ain't at all like the banter-heavy hotels of games past, which I think may have been deliberate, as it essentially carries with it the soul, or the absence thereof, of when one loses the ability to work on what you're passionate about. Inverted hotel dusk. Not warm, fun, sweet, and driven by a character with a genuine curiosity, but cold, short, quick to the point, and all business as the more fun-loving, sing-energy-esque Koto gets shat on and shut down for her mystery-driven enthusiasm. Luckily, I guess. While this could have also made for a game in which the player felt as detached as not giving a shit, they made the very wise choice of making it about solving the actual case as these two than it is about all of the people who just happen to be involved. And the Grump vs. Rookie dynamic does have that opposites friction that last window had. The way they go over cases with Koto excitedly bringing up theories and the Nase replying with No bitch, what are you, dumb? Stupid? It clearly happened like this. Even though her rookiness may lead to more unorthodox solutions that make a man go, huh, not huh, enough for them to really exceed their tropes ever, but hey, you know, they tried. The case does evolve in quite a neat way at least, where prior to questioning, Koto will go over her research, giving you some ammo and titbits, like say, the reason for someone doing something or time and place, which then during interrogation you can dish out, only not in that literal ammo danganronpa sort of way, but in a way that legit rewards your own ability to pay attention by being able to pick the right way to phrase a question to get the reaction that you want out of this heated antagonistic debate. So not only do the little pre and debriefs give you info, that info itself leads to more info due to your own quick thinking. Additionally, all suspects, while not the deepest characters, do very much end up having minor bits and bobs in common with each other, which then leads to you being able to learn stuff from one suspect that you can apply to another. It, 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 it's still not the most involved game ever, but for a title that's totally touting text it sure as shit feels as if it is, once again using that trademark sing idea of making the little things the biggest things and the mundanities interesting. Cause I mean, a gas explosion at a hospital is hardly the most exciting sounding case. It's not exactly on par with the raincoat killer or what have you, but small whodunits still emerge from the simple fact that the who's don't want to have done it. As I said, antagonistic debates. People don't really so much have big revealing secrets to hide as much as that they just don't want to share their entire fucking private life with some asshole investigating a gas leak. But through that, those tiny little private moments become super interesting. Uh, this be the type of game that have you go, aha, so he's the one who bought the portable stove. As if that's the biggest fucking reveal in the whole wide world. Plus, considering that Chase Gold Case is only about an hour and a half long, they absolutely did the most with what they had. It's just that what they had wasn't much to begin with, both in terms of budget, the actual license, or the time needed to flesh things out. But it's still a neat little mystery regardless. That's good for getting all comfy and cozy with a cup of cocoa, if only to compensate for how cold this case truly is. <laughs> In conclusion, Last Windy is very much more of the same as Hotel Dusk, only somehow even better. The pacing, the characters, the integration of gameplay, and the simple fact that it takes place inside of an apartment complex rather than a hotel all make it pretty damn strong. Reason I said somehow, though, is because the first game is quite legendary as is. 
Not something I would have pegged them to be able to top, but here we are. With easily Singh's best game, which, yeah, makes it extra sad that this was also their last. Just the way that the whole thing builds up its mysteries as all of the seemingly mundane or separate character plots end up contributing to the mass mystery that is its greater story, seamlessly involving Kal's past, the building's past, the past game, and each and every member of its cast in the most naturally written way, it's goddamn excellent. Perfectly paced, with a perfect game length to express all of that effortly as well, clocking in at a meaty but not overbearing 40 now. And sadly, that is where Chase Cold Case falls short. Like, I'm, I'm not over-exaggerating when I say that the game feels like more of a first chapter, as this case breakdown Kyle Height premonition shit only happens once. It looks like something that should bookend each chapter, but it don't, because it only has one chapter. Otherwise, it sets up the two main characters pretty well, introduces all of the basic tools that you'll be working with, and leaves a fair few open mysteries, like whatever the deal is with not Hyde getting these mysterious headaches, or why this weird kid keeps on coming back to make friends. It has all the hallmarks of this being a prologue, introductory chapter to a greater game, or a series of episodic releases, but that ain't what we got. All we're left with now is an ending that makes you go, Oh, okay, cool, so where do we go from here? Oh, but hey, at least I got nothing bad to say about Last Window, if only maybe that some fill states can drag on a bit and that navigating isn't always as smooth, but the latter really is more to do with the DS than anything else. But even just the music and art are just goddamn perfect. Jazz is a bit of a theme in the game, in ways I'm not sure I'd want to quite give away, but it fits like a glove as the soundtrack is drenched in it. Though not in a stereotypical way. L dubs has noir illusions for sure, especially in the way that Kel contemplates in the chapter transitions being styly and jazzy, but the OST, much like the overall tone, is pretty peppy and wholesome. It's those same fun time vacation vibes Satoshi Okubo managed in Deadly Prem 2, only better as there's more of it. Just strutting about the apartment building with the cozy beige tones and lighting as you see the transparent pixelated PNG light layers paint the hallways with a painterly brush, taking a stop to appreciate the minor details and how neat all of the tiny little low poly assets look with texture work that I can only describe as crunchy. Which helps making the examining more fun, but also complements the equally crunchy DS sound chip music. The compression layers on these MIDI jazz instruments, filled with the hazy choir pads and deep acoustic basses, give off quite the right amount of texture that Kyle's legally distinct Blue Note jazz record collection no doubt carries as well. It's, it's quite frankly perfect and very special. And I could honestly say the same about Sing's games in general. Even the flawed ones had an undeniable vibe, but the two Hotel Dust games stand as a testament to how great their storytelling capabilities truly were. Sadly, their games just didn't sell. And in a world where art is commodified, that meant that they could not continue making more works like this. Who knows how much better they could have gotten, how many more cool adventures Cal could have gone on, but... No sales means no freedom. Get shut down. Can't even fucking use their own characters as Nintendo owns those, hence why Chase is what it is as well. Nothing more than a mini-budget opportunity. A shadow of a license long lost, funded by a publisher who knew fully well that giving it any more would only result in losses. People talk a lot about how bad the games industry is, the shit going on at Ubisoft, the scummy monetization practices, the exploitation of gullible kids, the constant shutting down of studios in the face of bogus sales projections. It's all just fucked, isn't it? As an artist, I can't help but look at shit like this and end up frustrated. The fact that a dev's ability to express themselves is wholly dependent on money and not just their pure desire to do so is fucked up. Sure, games need money to be made in the first place, but that's also only because shit works as it currently does. If people didn't need rents to pay, if electricity bills weren't a thing, if art funding projects were more readily available across the world, and if marketing didn't have to be because sales projections don't exist, then budgets would barely even be a thing people could just do the things that made them happy, rather than whatever some cunts say they had to be fucking doing. And if there's one thing Cal Hyde shows, it's that even when you're fired and are about to get evicted, simply having the ability to just follow your fucking heart for once and be free is more than enough to turn shit around for the better. 
But sadly, as sing shows, we don't usually get that freedom and ability to begin with. And that is why video games are all about epic trilogies.